Hans, congratulations. Your speech was really good, food for thought. And because I want to hear more of it, I'll try to challenge you and disagree a little bit. Uh, you made it seem as if uh, going from a state of no culture as human beings to the state of culture somehow was a conscious agreement between human beings to find tools or artifices to uh, reach their purposes. Uh, and to me, it seems like too much of separation between nature and culture because we see among animals quite a lot of quite complicated languages. I'd call them languages, of course, nothing compared to the complexity uh, of the human being. Uh, we see tools used by animals and, of course, by our ancestors. So it looks more like a spectrum which emerged out of our nature. And, of course, then complexities or at some certain level of complexity, you can call it a more interesting culture and a more complex culture. But uh, I, I think you focus too much on the gulf between the nature and culture. I, I would doubt that we can speak of animals using instruments. Um, we can give completely causal explanations for them doing certain things. It has also never happened that animals were constructing something that they cannot do by nature. Um, men can construct instruments that make him, enable him to do things that he could not do by nature. We can construct a car, we construct an airplane, Yes, we have beavers doing building dams, but no beaver has ever done anything else but building dams or come up with, oh no, we just d divert the flow of the river or something of, of that kind. So the explanation that we can give for animal behavior, we would not need any reference to human or teleological vocabulary of goals and means and ends and success and failure, uh, we can, we do that because sometimes we like animals and like to describe them in human terms, but we could easily explain all of that in causal terms just as much. Um, also when, when animals learn something that they didn't know how to do before, like uh, 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 like circus, uh, circus animals or something like that. That we can, again, this learning we can describe in a causal way. Uh, reinforcement, repetition, uh, beating them or, or not beating them, giving them a, a, a piece of sugar and whatever it is. We never need human terminology to explain their behavior, but in our case we do. That, is, that would be my point. Actually, the, the naturalistic position can also be challenged that there are many natural phenomena that we cannot truly explain without a teleo teleological uh, uh, element, right? Uh, such a uh, function of an eye, for example. Whenever we talk of a function, right? an eye, a liver, any, any human organ, uh, a cell, right? DNA, uh, information content, and so on. Uh, you cannot just, uh, in, in the old ter terminology, you cannot just explain this in terms of, uh, of the material uh, characteristics and the so-called efficient causes, right? So what came before and then what came after, you need to have a teleological argument. I want to ask whether you will agree um, and perhaps expand up upon this idea um, that another couple of good examples besides language are law, in particular, complex uh, legal systems that emerge spontaneously over time. I think that this argument actually was, was made by Hayek and Suda Shenoy as well. Um, and also as a second example, uh, as a second additional example, religion, and in particular one aspect of religion that is liturgy. Uh, different liturgies that embody sophisticated meanings that are transcendent. I think that these are Another couple of examples that, that can work uh, just as well as language. Oh, of course I agree. I only took language is, so to speak, the most important meta-institution that makes lots of other institutions possible. So there's no disagreement here. I, last year I spoke here for two hours and I, I thought that might have been a little bit too much. Um, so this, this time I wanted to be short and sweet. I don't know if the sweet thing uh, did occur, but short it was. Um, 
there's no, there's no disagreement whatsoever. I just didn't have time to go through all other aspects of culture besides the aspect of language. I, I, w I would like to, to take your example of law, uh, which, which interests me most. Um, by the way, I'm not that much on your line, as you know, concerning this question, nature versus culture, or however you call it. Um, and I namely mean that the law could be an interesting example to, to, to make a, a, another viewpoint. Many speak about natural law, and this, this means something. This means that these are principles that have to be found, not created by man. Often when one says human law is something agreed upon by man, things like that, but I would say it's more convincing or more consequent to approach that subject by, by trying to understand the regularities that are there in nature regularities of behavior that in this situation this reaction will come up um, even though within so to speak in the inner view of such a conflict then there are arguments there are purposes there are um, normative um, goals things you are mentioning even though within these um, procedures things like that happen, I would say from the outer view, so to speak, these are natural processes. And they are highly, terribly high complex. They are so complex that we never will have any chance to get them. So I, I think there we are not in, 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 the, in the argument or in, in the aspect you, you mentioned that maybe some time, but that will be later, we will have the possibility to catch the whole picture, something like that. I would say we never will reach that possibility. It will always be beyond our capacity, brain capacity or so. Um, but nevertheless, or I would say it's not a cause that it's not a natural, a natural phenomenon, a phenomenon. When we speak of natural law, we of course speak of something that has a purpose for purposefully acting individuals. When we speak of something being a conflict, a conflict is something entirely different than banging this bottle against uh, a glass. Um, we can of course metaphorically also say uh, there is a conflict between that bottle and, um, and the glass, that it is that we interpret certain events as conflicts has something to do that we do have purposes and our, one of our purposes is of course to overcome conflicts because conflicts are considered by us as some sort of problem that should be solved. This is not something that either the glass or the bottle considers as something that should be solved in some way. But of course I can say that. But when I say that, it is just metaphorically speaking so. I completely agree with the importance of purpose and uh, teleology. Um, and at the same time, I think um, I'm more with Rahim and, and David about the continuum um, in, in within complex systems, complex adaptive systems, we, we see there's the central concept of emergence and um, that cannot be explained from the lower levels, so you have a qualitative shift, but it's never, nevertheless a natural process. And um, to get more specific, in animals in, in the recent 10, 15 years, uh, we've now discovered that they can not just use tools, but actually even put together tools that are multi-stage tools so that they would have to see that if I do this, plus this, plus this, then it will enable me to get the banana off the tree. I think, that, I think those are all metaphorical descriptions of things that can, com, com, can be fully explained in causal terms. There are, 
I think the most important philosopher who does deals with this is Peter Janich. Um, I, those people who can read, most of his books were only written in German, um, but those people who can read German, I can recommend the book that deals m most directly with is this issue, has written many books that deal with it uh, more indirectly. Um, the book is called uh, From Menschen und Anderen Tieren. Um, who also just shows that all of these interpretations, they use instruments and so it, this is all bull uh, to, be, uh, to be drastic. Um, yes, you, yes, you can, of course, describe what they do in terms as if they make an instrument and then they make another instrument in order to r reach some f further, further distant goal. But you can also describe that in a completely different, simple, simple way. Um, and what I said before, no animal of any species has ever construct, constructed an instrument that was entirely new, never happened in that species before. Um, whereas mankind has constructed uh, artifacts that that did not exist ever, uh, completely new things, which then all all of a sudden become common instruments. But the example of cars and airplanes. Men cannot fly by nature, but we can fly. Men cannot run very fast, but we can move in a very fa fast way. N no animal has ever instrument invented an instrument that made it do things that it couldn't do by nature. One question for Guido and one for Stefan. Um, Guido, at one point you mentioned that uh, primitive tribes have neither a concept of property nor a concept of gifts. And uh, I'm curious if this is really true, and this is kind of in a continuation of the previous thread, um, because in the 1960s, Robert Ardrey wrote this book, The Territorial Imperative. Um, he was an anthropologist and he also studied animals. And the subtitle of the book is The Animal Origins of Property and Nations. And um, he looks at the territorial behavior and so on. And I think this is actually a strong argument against the, uh, the socialists and so on that claim that, na uh, that property, etc., is an unnatural thing that was invented by humans. You can actually see the continuity of where it starts with animals and we take it to a far more sophisticated level, but the roots are there. So I'm just curious if you are familiar with with this work? Yes, I mean, I had also 30 minutes, so I had to get to the, the essentials. Uh, what I related was the, the point of view of Mao's, right? What, what he did, so there's this anthropological research, you have people from the West, scholars, go to these islands, they study societies with the objective they had in mind. But of course, we have to keep in mind that it was, the, the, they were pursuing a cause, right? Malinowski uh, may be less than, than Morse, but Morse definitely had a political axe to grind, okay? Uh, now, all of this is, of course, likely to, to bias the result of your research. And there is a huge literature, uh, especially in the past 30 or 40 years, uh, detailing how uh, the, the results, of, there are other researchers uh, uh, go, going to these tribes, and of course, by interacting with the tribe, right? The, the, the fiction is that they're just observing, but by interacting with them, they are already modifying this uh, 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 behavior. Mm -hmm. Another problem is that uh, the researcher doesn't go there just, I mean, to, to, to see these tribes in their state of nature. These were all colonized areas. That mm -hmm. is, uh, they wouldn't treat them exactly as they would in a state of nature. Probably they might have eaten them, or at least uh, uh, yeah. snacked a little bit on, on his teeth or something like this, right? Uh, so all of these are huge problems. I was just mm -hmm. relating from the argument is we go there, we observe their behavior, and there's always a tit for tat. Mm -hmm. right? So therefore, the claim is in primitive societies, there is no such thing as gift. And of mm -hmm. course, it's related to the absence of property, uh, private property, as mm -hmm. I've explained. Stefan, the, the key thing in your uh, presentation was about ownership. and. Um, I would love to see what the definition is of ownership that you consider the, like a good definition of ownership. Like what are the criteria, what are the elements that have to be present for something to be owned? Um, one of the elements that you mentioned was scarcity. 
and um, I just kind of would like to ask my questions and uh, finish the questions here. The, um, the key thing, I think, with scarcity is that historically, scarcity was tied to a material component. But with the invention of Bitcoin and, and similar digital entities, you now can have scarcity um, even though there's no material component related directly to the scarcity. And I think that is the key uh, innovation in Bitcoin, is precisely that you can have digital scarcity, which previously was not possible. So I'm thinking that th your tying of um, scarcity to a material element is a historical accident because it didn't exist uh, previously, but now you can have non-material scarcity. So I'm just curious about what you think there and, um, and, and the definition of property, of, of, of ownership. Okay, so on ownership, um, I didn't get into it here. Uh, a simplistic definition would be as, as opposed to possession or control of a thing that's a fact is the legally recognized or socially recognized right to control. But I think even that definition is wrong and actually I've uh, by analogy to intellectual property, which I oppose the law, but if you understand, say, patent law very well, you understand that the patent right is not really a right to do something, it's the right to exclude other people. So if I, if I invent something new, I can get a patent on it, which can block other, I can use to block other people from doing that, but it doesn't give me the right to do it because doing that very invention might trespass on someone else's patent. So the essence of that kind of right is the right to exclude. Now, I oppose the legitimacy of that particular right, but that's the essence of it, is the right to stop or the right to block, which is why I classify patent and copyright as what we call in the law a negative servitude. It's, it's, it's like a restrictive covenant. And the more I've thought about it, I think all rights are like that. And the, all property rights are basically the right to stop other people from doing something, not the right to do anything. And the re I've written on this in a couple of blog posts about um, there's a common argument used uh, in defense of intellectual property, which is that I claim that a patent gives the owner of the patent the right to prevent you from using your property as you see fit, and that's a, uh, that's a restriction of your property rights. And the response is typically, but all property rights are rights to limit what people do. And they give the example about my right to swing my fist stops where your nose ends, this kind of thing. So they use this common conception of property as the right to do something and combine with the fact that it's limited by others' property rights to say that, well, no property rights are, are unlimited, so what's wrong with intellectual property? And so I think that like owning your, owning your body or owning a gun, let's say, doesn't give you the right to do anything with it. It simply means you can prevent other people from doing something with it. And that gives you the practical right to use it as you see fit as long as you don't invade their property. So I think ownership means really the right to exclude others from using the resource, which is why they have to get your permission to use it. It amounts to the same thing, but it's a subtle dis difference that clears up that. Um, and what was the other part? I, I think this is one thing I had to admit in the slides, but scarcity is another word that has sort of dual meanings. Uh, I think most people think of scarcity as some kind of limitation of supply because it's the lack of abundance. What I think we mean in terms of human action is the lack of superabundance, um, which basically does mean a material thing in some sense, something that could be a means of action. Now. Bitcoin, I think, in a sense, is not scarce in the economic sense. It's not, it's because, first of all, you could have many Bitcoin chains. You could say that the digits, uh, the, the numerals from zero to nine, there's 10 of those, they're scarce in that sense. There's a limitation of supply. There's only 10 digits. So therefore, they should be ownable too, if you go by that criteria. So I don't think scarcity in the lack of abundance sense is a, a criteria of ownership. I think. It's basically what can be a scarce means of action. Um, the, uh, Bitcoins are useful, and they're, they're ownable in the first sense of means, right? They're, they're, they're controllable. But I don't think they're subject to legal ownership, which is the point uh, of the talk. Perhaps for that, I, I wasn't 100% clear, neither after, after your um, uh, presentation, mainly about what is then the, the the outcome of the fact that you say it's, it's not ownership. I mean, what the, is the sanction, yeah. so to speak, if it's not ownership, while what would be the sanction in the other, right. 
uh, in, in the other case. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the consequence of considering Bitcoin to be ownable would be simply this. Um, if I own this phone and I lose it, the law would consider my, I'm still the owner even if, or if, if someone steals it, right? Someone steals this. It's still my phone. So down the line, if I find it, I can, re I can re retrieve it even by the use of force, even if it's in the hands of an innocent third party, something like that. I still retain ownership of it. In the case of Bitcoin, in the most common cases you can think of where people would call it theft, which is a metaphor, which would be breaking into someone's home or hacking their computer and getting their key that way and then taking it. Um, it is a type of theft, but the th it's a consequence of committing a trespass in the first place. The only other case where you couldn't already consider it to be, or, or a breach of contract, if you give your accountant or your attorney the key, that's a breach of contract. So those two common cases where you could see a Bitcoin actually being taken without the consent of the owner, um, uh, or if the FBI arrests you and they coerce you into giving the key, and there's coercion. So all three cases, there's some kind of breach of an already existing law that can be accounted for in, in normal terms. So the only other case would be if someone guesses or somehow uses a quantum computer or something, right, to guess your private key. And if you own the Bitcoin that was taken by that means, then... The only, that would imply that you could use the legal system to give an order to all the 10,000 node operators on the Bitcoin system. You need to change, update the ledger to unroll this transaction to give this guy his keys back. So now you're giving an order backed by force against innocent property owners to tell them how to use their own hard drives. And I think that's, that's the difference. So if you don't call it legally owned, you would never have that ability. If, if you lose, you lose. You have to get insurance or something to prevent that, or choose a cryptographic system or a, a cryptocurrency that that is not hackable in that way. So that's the reason, to me, it makes a difference. It, uh, just because I don't think the law should be able to direct the third parties. It's analogous to the trade secret problem. Most people don't understand why I'm opposed to trade secret law. There's nothing wrong with keeping secrets, but trade secret law allows the so-called owner of the trade secret to use government force, a court order, not only against the employee who left and leaked the secret he was contractually bound not to, but third parties to whom he's told it. That's the problem. They didn't have a contract, they're not in privity of contract, and the information is not property, so that's unjust. So that, to me, that would be analogous to the problem with owning Bitcoin. I'm very interested in the, in the, um, in the controversy between humanism and naturalism in the opposite uh, attitude, to see a purpose not only in animals, but especially in nature. We have it these days, nature is superior some way to humans, and uh, nature should be conserved how it is. Uh, it cannot rise or fall in temperature, and uh, man cannot meddle with nature, whereas the story of human civilization is exactly meddling with nature and changing nature with purposeful action. And so I'd like a comment on this nowadays common attitude to see nature as something superior to human beings. Yeah, I, I agree with my regard largely with my teacher, Murray Rothbard, who, who said nature as such is mostly yuck. Um, <laughs> The, what what we like about nature is of course precisely culture uh, that is uh, gardens that are taken care of uh, if you look if you compare for instance let's say the the Alps with the Rockies I mean the Alps are far more beautiful than the Rockies because it is culture and the Rockies is just mostly yuck um, <laughs> So I have, I, but of course we have to, we have to know something about nature to cultivate nature. Um, I mean, every, every gardener knows, of course, plenty of stuff about plants uh, in order to create out of something that uh, nature provides something that is more beautiful than, than nature, um, nature by itself. Um, so I, I love cultivated nature, but, um, uh, and uh, in that regard, I also think that, uh, that what the Bible advises us to do is 
absolutely right. All of these other things are there uh, in order to be taken care of and cultivated by men for human purposes. Um, as far as far as climate climate is concerned, we already uh, talked about that. Regardless of how the um, yeah how the explanation for uh, uh, the climate is concerned, whether that is uh, changing sunspots that do that or CO2 that does that, none of these questions are really clarified up to this point to begin with, even though, uh, of course, our brilliant politicians all claim that they somehow know how all these things work, even though they cannot even build an airport in one, in one year. Um, the, the all decisive question in all of this, and I think that is, in all of the discussions almost never mentioned is the fact, even if we would know precisely how to influence the weather, then what is the right temperature or range of temperatures for the world population as a whole with people living here and some people living near the North Pole, some people living, living near the South Pole, some people living high up in the mountains, other people living uh, in, in some river valleys. What arrogance is it of people to say, I know the right range of temperatures for the entire world population. I mean, these people should be incarcerated to believe things like this. Do you know, by the way, that musical Camelot? Camelot, and there is this beautiful song, it's true, it's true, the crown has made it clear the climate must be perfect all the year. <laughs> and then, then comes a lot of beautiful examples, precisely, I do not recall precisely, by end of September, the first time snowflakes must come. And at, at five o'clock in the afternoon, the last cloud must disappear. Things like that, you know, precisely defined. And this came to my mind when I, when I, I, I hear these programs you're alluding to. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think, it's, it's an interesting question how libertarians do deal with, with this discussion. I do not say with these problems, maybe there are no problems, but with these discussions. And I think we, um, a, a consequent approach is if people have problems with some developments and if they articulate standpoints against them, for instance, do not fly that much around in, in the world, then maybe there are other people that do not have this position. And as always, if there are conflicts, one should treat it as conflicts are treated. It is what, 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 what I would say as a lawyer is that, that we have a conflict that must be solved, that um, some independent instance, some independent procedures should take place to look at the case, to um, maybe consider that if one side should reduce its activity, for instance, that the other side, at the very least, should compensate it for reducing it. So all these victims of in my environmental um, pollution are probably the payers in such a, um, a litigation and not those that are just get the, the advantage. So it, generally I would say it's an issue to be judged, um, not decided. That should be dealt with in a horizontal way. Some parties fighting together and then trying in some objectivizing procedure to find a solution and not in a vertical way. It is to create some imaginary instance, of course the state or a conglomerate of states um, that then decide just because those up there are of this opinion. They do not, they do not um, balance a conflict. They decide according to their ideology. And I think that's the problem. 
It's the way how we deal with it that we do not make it in a horizontal way, but instead, unfortunately, in a vertical way. I have a question for Professor Hopper and anyone else who would like to, um, to add anything to it. Um, the reflections with which you began your lecture made me think of similar but related, um, perhaps slightly different questions. Um, it seems one way of describing the reflections with which you began the lecture a different way is that man is in nature but not of nature. He is part of nature but is not quite the same. He is, if you like, imminent but also transcendent. And this, um, this makes me uh, curious about if you would, uh, curious whether you would be willing to offer uh, a metaphysical, uh, some metaphysical reflections on the, uh, the, the subject matter. Would you, um, as many earlier philosophers, um, some uh, idealists, uh, or Platonists or what have you, w would you say that the things that separate man from nature are essentially uh, supernatural or exist in a different realm in some sense? That man is always um, in nature, yes, but also trying to grope towards something outside of nature or something purely uh, spiritual um, or, or, or in any, at any rate something different that only metaphysical uh, philosophy uh, can explain. Yeah, I'm not quite sure if I understood the question right. I'm not quite sure how to answer it. I, I try to make the point that there are different aspects. Yes, of course, man is part of nature. Um, I mean, who would, who would deny that? Uh, in that in that regard, we are no different from whatever plants and, and and animals. Yes, we are animals too. As I mentioned, that that title of a book by Peter Janich, uh, from Menschen and und anderen Tieren of of men and other animals. Yes, we are animals, but there is an aspect to it that cannot be covered by by the natural sciences in the same way as we can cover and fully explain um, the behavior and the emanations of, uh, of animals and plants. We can, metaphorically speaking, we can use all terms that we apply to men also to other objects. Um, yeah. I mean, I can, I, I can describe the behavior of a stone as if it was a teleolo teleological phenomenon. Uh, why does a stone fall to the ground? Be because a stone uh, wants to fall to the ground. Uh, first, it wants to fly a little bit, and then it uh, takes a certain curve, and then it decides to, to fall to the ground. He, there's nothing wrong with describing that in this way, but we should be aware of the fact that it is a metaphorical way of speaking. Um, so I'm pleading in favor of a, of dual, a dualism of aspects when it comes to treating uh, treating men and and human human history. Both things do play a role. Uh, Lots of causal events influence how people act. Um, uh, lots of uh, causal, causally explainable things change how we behave. Uh, when we explain historical events, uh, yes, it's not only purposes of, uh, of people who explain historical events, not only the, cho the choice of means um, that, that they make in order to uh, reach the ends. There are also external events that have a causal explanation that define what the situation is in which we then have purposes and choose certain means in order to, to reach our our ends. Um, but I don't know if you answered that answers your question. But it, it was a complicated, the complicated one. 
it just reminded me, one t I was reading a patent one time and the claim that defined the invention was, it was a computer related invention with a processor and it defined things it did, took measurements, and then there was a step in the claim that said, wherein the computer believes X to be true. And of course the patent office allowed it. I mean, it's, so metaphors are rampant. I was wondering, let's say that if we are allowed to leave the club, as you <laughs> said, uh, the state, for example, um, since there is a need to pay compensation in most cases, uh, is there is there not a possibility that we will be extorted by the state, like that they will make us pay uh, immense amounts of compensation? And is there a way around this, or what do you think? If I understand you correctly, what are the, the principle of that compensation? In yeah, for example, if they make you pay um, immense amounts of money yeah. in order to cross... In order to keep you back and... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's say within these, these private law um, uh, provisions that, that I presented, uh, stemming from Roman law, ultimately, um, these, these um, compensations developed out of these processes, the compensation to be paid against getting or against um, getting this right to, to passage, there you have, you have actually a first question, is it just a compensation for the marginal costs created to your neighbor? Um, in case he has some more work to maintain this, this, this way or so, some additional cost to the cost he had anyway. So this marginal cost, this is usually in these private law legislations, this is the case. Namely in the so-called emergency rights of way. Notrecht, a Notwegrecht in German, so that if, if there are no other ways that you have to have there, you cannot choose anywhere, you have to choose the, the suitable way, and then you have to compensate for the additional costs. So when you have the chance that there is already a street or a way um, fitting to your needs, then, then actually, usually, then you have the possibility just to pay this, this relatively small, usually small amount. There is, you can look at it from a other point of view too, when you combine it with the other question. I, I came back then at the end of my presentation where so to speak you have a choice either being a member and paying the full membership tax of course on the one side or being a customer and paying only what you, what you take. And there, there is a completely different principle which has nothing to do with what I explained today. I had a presentation on that two years ago um, when I made an analogy to rules of cooperatives. One could say your membership with the state, that's like being member of a cooperative. This is also a bit the ideology of the state, you know, Schweizerische Eidgenossenschaft, which means Swiss um, cooperative, so to speak. Um, and there you have in this also old rules, not that old rules, that's not Roman law. These are rules developed mainly in the 19th century when this cooperative movement came up in Europe and, and in the United States, there you had a very high principle that you cannot be forced to, to um, remain in the cooperative. You have a right to, um, to leave it and the cooperative is not allowed to hinder this too much, for instance, by claiming too high um, uh, contribute, you know, to leave and then to, to use the, uh, uh, the service as a customer. So from these both sides, there are certain reluctance to, um, to, to have too high prices for that. 
you know, the, the time dimension you, you had not really included, but the time dimension also should play a role. I mean, for instance, in, in damage cases, um, uh, so I establish a certain property, um, I have n no immediate neighbors, I emit smoke from the place where I live. Then later on somebody moves into my vicinity, uh, should I should I have the right to continue uh, polluting the air? Uh, because when I established my property there, there was no neighbor. Uh, the neighbor who moved into my property, in, into my neighborhood, knew that what he appropriated was polluted. Does he have the right to stop? I would say he doesn't. Uh, I have uh, acquired my right to pollute earlier. Um, so in this Wegerecht problem, I would also think somehow the time dimension would have to be included in solving, in solving the problem. Uh, people who had the right to move to certain places when there was nobody there before and now somebody moves into my neighborhood, they should continue to be able to move through there, obviously, um, with some sort of marginal marginal cost considerations, whatever he adds to the, uh, to in cost in terms of maintenance of that property. Um, but if he was earlier there, it is different than he came later. Yeah, um, I see the point. I, I could not now comment more precisely what these rights of way is concerned, but but generally this aspect that the situation becomes denser, dichter, huh? denser, um, which is quite often the case in urban situation that earlier he was far away and in the meantime they come closer. Um, a, a interesting example I can um, make here is um, uh, a situation like that in Switzerland around the um, the airport with, with, with the noise uh, and pollution perhaps, but mainly the noise from the airport. Um, in the time when um, people bought a house relatively near that airport, depending on the time, there was no such noise yet, but later it, it, it became more and more. And then there, there was a big, um, uh, a big litigation with many, many parties around this, this um, airport. I think not all cases are finished uh, so far, but there came in a principle that that court said, um, apart from a certain date, it was, if I recall correctly, the date when it was known that this airport was going to build some additional uh, runways or so, that from that time point on, if somebody buys a house <coughs> or just moves there, he knows that this kind of additional nose will arise and therefore these do not have a right of compensation or a lower one, while those that were there earlier, they have a higher um, compensation. Maybe it has to do a bit with such situations. Let me, uh, I think the common law addresses your idea with what's called the, the doctrine of coming to the nuisance. So if, if someone pollutes, that can be a nuisance and it can be stopped. But if you come to the nuisance, the, the nuisance was there first. So it's, the, it's already in the law, I think, at least in the common law. No, no, I'm aware of that. I was, I was just trying to uh, bring up the question how that would apply to ways of uh, ways of right or rights of way, um, and obviously we would have to take this coming to the nuisance somehow into consideration in order to solve also this problem. And focusing more specifically on where he claims that the state has an obligation to provide a living for the man with some assistance from himself. Does Maus give any indication of what that proportion of self-effort versus communal effort should be? And secondly, does he identify the state as being something completely different from man? Who is the state? And does he recognize where the state acquires resources? 
Thank you. No, so he, he doesn't really address these questions at all. I think it was a matter of principle, right? He takes an um, opposition against, against what he seems to be the, the libertarian societies, a society built on private property rights, on individual decisions that are made at the margin and so on. He says, well, actually, that's an unnatural situation, as we can see by reference to uh, the study of primitive societies, which are natural, right? So we are nature distorted and they are nature pure so these are the good guys we are looking at them and say yeah there's this, this tit for tat right there's always a claim and obligation everybody has somehow a little claim there and it's all sorted out by custom you don't decide these things and uh, probably there there shouldn't be uh, uh, there is not one single institution that makes these uh, these decisions right so it's it's completely vague right the whole point was to uh, attack the, the, the principle that there are decisions of this sort. You can judge these things only by considering the totality of all uh, situations, right? So there's a full-blown attack on uh, methodological individualism as a scientific procedure. You analyze partial relationships and then take into account more and more partial relationships to come to a judgment of the whole. And he says, well, this is all baloney. We need to look at the whole from the outset. And only if we look at the, the whole, at the, the whole picture, can we understand or hope to understand what truly counts. David, I actually have a question for you. I was wondering um, if you would win this, and they actually the people can actually, you know, sort of hand in their uh, metaphorical membership. Um, would the idea be that, since there would have been a precedent created for voluntarily leaving, that there also should be a voluntarily entering or is that not well, as an idea present so you mean my daydream sure. of this class action against why not the, yeah yeah why not <laughs> yeah so it's it's without illusion but uh, but but serious um, i i would say the approach is that this organization in Switzerland, for instance, so-called Schweizerische Eidgenossenschaft, this confederation, is just an organization. It's, it's like a firm. They have 40,000 um, employees, uh, quite a considerable firm, but a firm. They uh, do not have a right to, to allegedly represent all 8 million people in Switzerland, but what they do. Um, but it's, it's a firm, and this means and, and mainly because it's a cooperative, the aspect I mentioned before, you have the right to, to leave it. This is one of the arguments. And of course, those who want to remain there, um, naturally, they, they have the right to remain there. They, they can maintain and they can, they can continue um, this organization if they like to be ruled that tightly from morning to night and to pay heavy taxes, that, okay, that's, if it's voluntary, um, I would not object again. Now you ask, your question is, is also a right to, to enter into, and there again, I would say it's again these cooperative traditions. This is really not just an analogy, I think really a fundamental um, element of structure of the state is a cooperative one and there in these rules I mentioned before where you have this right to leave whenever you want there is also a principle that once you are ready to follow the principle of this organization then you have a right to be admitted if you comply with all these rules they have so that should be I think um, the rule they will then have. If they don't, well, that's their problem then. Hmm? I was thinking more in the sense of if it should be decided that in fact people can legally leave, that that would actually imply that they would also not necessarily by default, in the sense of they're born and they're a member, that they also should not be by default a member just because of being born in a certain area. So that, in fact, that then would imply also that they would have to actively enter, sort of like you have to actively say yes if you want to be an organ donor. So, so you mean the, the, the formalities to meet, so to speak? <laughs> well, actually, it's, it's anyway, it's within this, this daydream. And, uh, and there I, I would say 
the most consequent approach would be really to handle it like a cooperative and um, and and perhaps what one should should then first articulate the will to leave this this organization and and then to 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 um, to, to send it there and then depending on the reaction uh, to to make more steps I agree that um, animals instinctively act in a way in line with the fact that um, natural laws are time invariant and universal, um, yet they do not understand this fact. Uh, they simply act in this way. And therefore, that animals can be fully uh, explained or their behavior can be fully explained in scientific terms, um, yet uh, men have experiences and they, uh, they uh, can use non-contradictory discrimination, that is they can use logic uh, to discover this fact that natural laws, uh, physical laws, uh, are time invariant and universal. And I would argue that it is this ability uh, of man uh, to recognize this fact and to ha have an, an, an to be logical, which sets him apart from all other other animals. But uh, this capacity to uh, non-discriminatory, uh, uh, non-contradictory discrimination is also possessed by artificial intelligence, um, and so. If, if a man is an animal, but an animal which has a capacity for non-contradictory uh, 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 discrimination, that is logic, which is also uh, uh, possessed by artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence can be fully scientifically explained, then doesn't these two uh, things together make that man as an animal and as uh, the, the thing that artificial intelligence also has can be fully explained in scientific terms? No. I say, the, look, artificial intelligence is not intelligent. Um, I say, uh, the, the, you see that when, when machines break down, uh, can a pocket calculator calculate? And the answer is no, it doesn't calculate. because it can break down and it doesn't know that it breaks down. We know that it broke down because we know what the result should be according to our purposes. So the, uh, talking about that machines are intelligent or something is all nonsense, is all just metaphorical speech. They are not intelligent. We are intelligent. That's why we can build them and we can recognize if they don't work what they are supposed to do. All machines can somehow break. How do we know that the, the machine doesn't know? The, even if the machine breaks, that can, explain, can be explained in causal terms. There are processes going on within the machine that explain, so to speak, why it broke. Um, but only we can, because we designed them with a certain purpose, can determine whether they do what they are supposed to do or whether they fail. So but in any case, so I think we should just now stop this uh, question and answer session. What you noticed here is that there are vigorous disagreements sometimes among us here, even though most people think that all oh, these libertarians are all of the same mind and they're completely intolerant when it comes to deviating opinions. Uh, I tell you, I'm, I'm very, very intolerant, but certain people, I tolerate even though I see that they don't, they don't agree with my opinion. So long live the libertarian movement. Thank you very much. We see each other. <laughs>